This is not the arena to impress you with what I think I should teach based on impressing you what I know. That's, that's not, see, because what I'm doing now at, at that point is tampering with the truth. It's got to be presented with such simplicity that you can receive it. Am I, does, all right, I'm, I'm just seeing them wrinkles in the, in the foreheads, and I'll be, does everybody understand what I'm saying? If it is not handled properly, then you're going to have a problem receiving. Every, everybody in here is going to have a problem receiving. So John helps us out with that. Now, one of the things I want you to keep in mind is, is this. There are some people who think because you cannot know everything, there's no need to know nothing. Got me? Can't, you can't do that. Let me take you to 1 John chapter 2. Did, did I uh, omit 21 deliberately or by mistake? Huh? It's not hot. That's all right. All right. John said this. Write this down. 1 John chapter 2 verse 21. You know it. He emphasizes in that verse to know the truth. Okay. Now remember what I told you from the start. Truth is knowable. You, you can know the truth. It's, it's a possibility. If you slide down to 1 John 2, 22, the ultimate question, listen to what it says. Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is the antichrist who denies the father and the what? Son. So the question is, can we know then that Jesus is the Christ? You got me? Knowing that is in the word. So the possibility is available to know that Jesus is whom? The Christ. Also in 1 John 2.22, the text teaches us that some of them denied such evidence. They denied such facts. Okay? Then in the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verse 30 and 31. And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So scripture teaches that it doesn't matter how much they deny that he is the Son of God, you can know the truth. Got me? In knowing the truth, it requires that we study the word of God. Okay, that's critical to the whole argument that is on the table. First Timothy chapter four, verse six. The doctrine of Christ must be faithfully taught. Now I'm going tonight is about us getting in the word. Listen to what Paul says. If you instruct the brothering in these things. You will be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the words of faith and of the good doctrine which you have carefully followed. Whew. I wish I could get the membership to understand the importance of being taught the doctrines of Christ. The, the more we get to know what the word requires of us, the better we can handle the truth. And the more of the truth you got a grip on, 
your chances of being shifted or moved is limited. And we're not here arguing and debating over whether you got baptized in the baptismal pool or whether somebody took you uh, down on riverfront. I don't care. See, see the, th those are trivial issues. That's not the truth of the text. The truth of the issue is, have you been baptized? Have you accepted Christ as your Lord? Just simple, practical, everyday things. So the Apostle Paul reminds us in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6 of such importance. You got to be taught. You can't grow if you have not been taught. Okay? If we would sit back and have no life application, no Bible study, you can't grow. You have to grow outside the church. You, you follow me? So, so we have a divine obligation here at the church to make sure that the word is dealt with. Let's go to Titus chapter 2, verse 1. It says, but as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. Now, here's the problem with the body of Christ. We're going to our grave fussing over the doctrines of Baptists versus Methodists and, and, and Seventh-day Adventists. Those are not the doctrines I'm talking about. We're talking about the doctrines of Christ, the doctrine of the Word of God. And these are things that are critical when it comes to us making a stand in our relationship with Christ. Okay? All right. The doctrine has to be, got to be, faithfully taught, constantly, faithfully taught. I have to teach it even when it ain't but three folk here. Two people, six, eight, ten, twelve. Got me? Brother Shelley does it every Sunday morning. Handful of saints. Okay? But it's not about the handful is, is allowing the Lord to see that we're being faithful with what he has blessed us to do irregardless to the number. All right. First John chapter 4 verse 1. You got to be careful that as a Christian, as a believer, that you examine your beliefs in light of God's truth. Don't go out and grab hold of something because it sounds good and you haven't taken the time to examine the word. Listen what he tells us. Beloved, do not believe every spirit. Do not believe every spirit. Do not believe every... Do not believe. Amen. See, it don't take much for some of us they get sidetracked with every spirit because we assume if the spirit is up in the church, it's the right spirit. Then we assume if, the, if that spirit is clapping and a shouting and a dancing, that they right. No, no, no. You got to test the spirit by the spirit. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God. And, 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 and it, that bothers me because we end up with stuff that just doesn't make no sense. If it has not been taught, then you shouldn't have a problem. But it's being taught constantly. So you shouldn't, you shouldn't have to come to me and ask me crazy stuff. Come on now. If, if I'm standing here telling you then you should, well, no. I okay. <laughs> no, that, that, that's, that's all right. Y'all be surprised of the questions or the statements or the comments. And I'm like, are y'all listening? I mean, come on. If, if you know that you don't have to feel hot to praise the Lord, Come on. Do, 
Do y'all not understand what I'm saying? Now, do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? <laughs> That's, that to me is critical because that says you are not receiving. See, just being here, I'm happy. But it's got to be more than just your presence. Taking good notes is not enough. You, you got to receive the truth. Okay? And you got to receive it with clarity, with understanding. If there is no understanding, you just got good notes on a piece of paper. Oh, boy. Okay, okay. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. All right. Watch what's on the table. Throughout John's argument, there has to be a strong connection between the issue of the anointing and knowing the truth. Are y'all, everybody got me? All right, got me. Okay, I was out to, I'll be reading them facial expressions and I'm like, Okay, so let, let me go and, and, and prove something. I didn't highlight this, Sister Paul, because they got their Bibles um, in, in their possession. If you look back in your Bibles at verse 20, okay, it is there that you ought to see the result of the anointing. And then in verse 21, in your Bibles, you ought to see knowing the truth now there has to be okay a connection between the anointing and the truth now let me take you to what Jesus says in John chapter 8 verses 31 and 32 Jesus had simply said that if people know the truth they will be made free Listen to what he says. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word. See, that's a powerful statement, but it's a statement we need to understand. He says, if you, if you what? Abide in my word, you are my what? Disciples in D. See, now you ought to see an open target when Christians don't abide in the word we become easy prey for the enemy that connects with what we're dealing with on Sunday morning depression problems issues you, you become a candidate all of us in here yes sir all of us in here are candidates. But you don't have to deal with opening the polls up and vote to become depressed. Or a problem. Why? Simply because you see the importance of abiding in the word. Got me? Because the moment we don't abide... We got nothing, yes sir, we got nothing to think about. We got nothing to focus on. We're empty. And there are a lot of members in the body of Christ, they are empty. Their spirit is empty. Their hearts are empty. Their minds are empty. And when your mind is empty, Satan will bring anything to your mind and drop it in there. Boy, y'all look at me like I... And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. That's how powerful the truth is in the text that John is talking to us about because so many Christians are bound. You've been made free in your relationship with Christ, and we turn right back around and let the problems and issues of life get us tied up because we're too lazy to get in the truth. We don't have an appetite. We're not thirsty. We're not hungry for the word of God.
Watch the text. Jesus said that if people know the truth, the truth will make you what? Free. So the truth that Jesus presents in the text refers to his own revelation of the will of God in our lives. Am I making sense to you? Does everybody understand? Got it? The reason I'm saying that, because we're getting ready to make a move. And this is one of those moments before I take this leap, I need your ear. I got to have your ear. If I don't get your ear, you might get lost. Okay? Now, what did I tell you we were working on? Characteristics of whom? Christians. Characteristics of Christians. All right. Verse 27. Verse 27. First John chapter 2. Listen now. Once again. To what John mentions. Regarding Christians. He says. But. The anointing which you have received from him abides in you. And you do not need that anyone teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things and is true, and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. All right, now, I'll tell you, tell you what I, I'm going to do. So, so, Paul, back it up. Start back at that verse again. I got to read it again, and I want y'all to listen. Listen carefully now. He's talking to whom? He's given a descriptive nature of whom? Christians. All right. But the anointing which you have received from him abides in you. And you do not need that anyone teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things and is true and is not a lie and just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. Now John said some stuff. But you got to watch something in the text. Because to understand this, I'm going to have to back up and make some connections with stuff y'all already got in your notes for us to understand everything. Okay? So allow me to do this. I want to take the first part of the verse. The very first part. I want to deal with the part where John says, but the anointing which you have received from him abides in you. All right. Very first thing. I know I didn't do this, Sister Paul, but I'm going to see if you could do it for me. Can you back up? And give me verse 20. Okay. Just stick up 20 right quick. Don't, don't, don't let go of 27 in y'all's mind. All right. You see what 20 says? But you have an anointing from whom? The Holy One. So the first thing that must be done is that the anointing in verse 27 is a reflection 
of the anointing in verse 20. I hope, hope y'all, does everybody see that? And, and, and John is very detailed. He even tells you the giver. But you have an anointing from whom? The Holy One. So the anointing here in verse 27 is the same anointing that you find in verse 20. Are we all together? You're not talking about two different anointings. All right. There is a word. Now, now, Sister Paul, take me back to 27. All right. That's the phrase we're playing with. The word I want you to write down in your notes is received. <laughs> All right. Now, once again, to understand everything, you have to keep the thought of John's teaching together. Okay? In verse 27, he says, but the anointing which you what? Have received. Just stop right there. Okay? Have done what? Received. Now, I hate to have you doing this, Sister Paul, but pop up verse 24. Yes, verse, verse 24. I, it's the, it, I didn't highlight it. I was I deliberately didn't do it, and then I thought, I, I, I need them to see it. Okay, okay. Now, what did I just tell you to write down? Receive. Y'all stay with me. Listen to what John just said now. In verse what? 24. Therefore... Let that abide in you which you heard from what? The beginning. Stay with me. First he said, you what? Heard. No, you heard. Now you what? Receive. Because you cannot receive what you haven't heard. Sure hope y'all getting this. I'm, I'm going to get to a conclusion to show you something. Okay? Are we all on the same page? What I'm trying to show you is that in this, in this thought pattern of, of John's argument in presenting to the Christians, the power rests on understanding something, and I'm going to connect something that will show us and move our thinking from this. That's my objective. Because that's basically where we stay. All right, all right. All right. Oh, Sister Paul, okay. All right. You should see the next one should be 27. Right back where we started. Okay? So the afraid, look at, look, look at 27. The phrase abides in you would have the same meaning as it has in verse 24. Nothing changes. You got me? Same meaning. So it almost sounds as though John is repeating what he has already what? Said. Now, take me. All right. I'm going to stay right there on the abide. Listen to what he says. But the anointing which you have received from him abides in you. Okay, I'm going to play with y'all for a minute. How can this abide in you? Can't. It can't. It, 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 it can't. It cannot. It can go on you. But it can't abide in you. Okay? So that ought to change for a moment our thinking about anointing. Because if you're born again, every born again believer 
has to have what John is talking about. Because he said it what? Abides. All right, let's stay with abides. In abiding in you, his presence is permanent. Oh, boy, y'all. Look, 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 at, look at what John says in the text. It's permanent. But the anointing which you have received from him abides in you. Stop right there. That means he does not go in and out. He's permanently in you. Woo! I'm, I'm taking you somewhere because the argument has a lot to do with what John has already said so we can get a clear understanding of what he's saying in verse 27. So the phrase, the concept abide, that's constant. That, that is permanent. Sister Paul, I know I, I messed you up. Didn't I give you Galatians 5.16? Yes. Listen to what he says. This is Paul. I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. How can you possibly walk when he's in and out? He's not in and out. He is in you what? Permanently. Listen to Peter in 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 6. Peter says, therefore, it is also contained in the scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. So that means you will not be caught with him slipping out the house. Does everybody hear me? So when John, make, when John makes the statement, but the anointing which you have received from him abides in you. Now, here's the thing. What I want you to write in your notes is that the word abides is in the present tense. What John is doing, John is teaching his readers their standing in their relationship with God the Father and God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Got me? How can I be assured he abides in me? How do I know he abides in me? Notice what I haven't said. I feel him. I didn't say that. I said what? He abides in me. See, why, why not I feel? No, no, no. He abides, not he elevates your feelings. See, feelings come and go. Everybody got me? All right, go back to the text. But the anointing which you have received from him abides in you. Now here, Sister Paul, can you back up the verse 20 for me? Give, give me 20. I apologize. I, I, I. But you have an anointing from whom the Holy One. So according to that verse, the other night in Bible study, we concluded that John is talking about the Holy Spirit. Remember, I concluded and said, I don't, I'm not here to argue because we know that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are whom? One. Now I'm going to take you somewhere now. Uh, I don't know if I'm looking at that. 
I, I, I couldn't be looking at the bottom because that's, that's, that's right. Take me to my next text, which is John chapter 14. Now, here's something I want to make sure is embedded in your spirit. Before Jesus left after his crucifixion, before he left, he made it very clear in Scripture that he was not going to leave and leave us empty. So in John chapter 14, beginning with verse 16 down to 20, listen to how certain you ought to be about him abiding in you. He says, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may what? Abide with you forever. Now we can stop right there. Because now that coincides with what John has just said. See, you, you got to already know that you got him. That he what? Abides in you. Mm. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Oh, boy. Verse 19. 18, I'm sorry. A little while longer... I will not leave you orphans. I, 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 I thought I was looking at it right. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. Woo! And a little while longer, and the world will see me no more. But you will see me because I live, you will live also. His abiding is so permanent. That in that great getting up morning, the moment we make our exit, we're going to have the assurance that his abiding in us is permanent. Got me? I didn't want to go this route, but I'm, I'm trying to get you all to thinking in your mind, his anointing is in me. I have his presence abiding in me. All right. Since we concluded last week on the issue that John has reference to the Holy Spirit, I'm going to walk you through just a few things, okay, to get us to understand the importance of the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives, okay? So that you, I'm, I'm trying to get you away from thinking this. I'm not saying it's, it, it, this ain't something you don't use. That's not what I'm trying to get you to understand. We're talking about what John is teaching in the text. All right. Let me take you to John chapter 6, verse 44. The Holy Spirit should convict of us of sin. And at the same time, after one is convicted, it ought to draw us to God. Listen to what he says. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Well, how am I to be drawn? I am drawn to God when I become convicted of my sins. I'm not drawn because I got excited on a Sunday morning. Does everybody hear me now? Because your excitement won't keep you. <laughs> everybody hear me? That's critical. You are convicted. When you become convicted of your sins, God turns around and draws you to him. Because what good is it to become convicted of sin and you're going to leave me out there? Y'all making me sweat tonight. Just write this down in order that I might expedite time. 
John chapter 16, verses 7 down to 11. Okay? All right? All right, so the first thing you should have is that the Holy Spirit, what? Convicts us of sins and draws us to whom? To God. Why do you think in Scripture we are taught to confess our sins? When you own up to it, he'll do the drawing. But when you disown it, you are left out there. So when people sometimes come and say, I just didn't feel nothing, you might want to have a personal examination of yourself because there's a strong possibility that you are piling up stuff that you have not yet been convicted of. You, you got to realize I, I messed up. Number two, number two, number two. Second thing is that I want to take you to John chapter 1, verse 12 and 13. Okay. The Holy Spirit now borns us into the family of God. Listen to what the word says. But as many are received, as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. You are not a child of God because your name is on the church roll. You become a child of God because you became, once you got convicted of your sins, he borns you into his family. And let me really mess with you tonight. You are so born into his family, Negroes can't vote you out. Am, am I making any sense to you? You are rooted and grounded in his family. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. Watch verse 13. Who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. Now, sometimes certain scriptures ought to, ought to connect with some things I, I've been teaching on. Now you can see when people are drawn into a church by the wrong things, they will always have a problem. Why? Because they miss what this is. See, I, I'm, I'm so convicted and enjoying my relationship with him, I can't allow Satan to whisper in my ear, uh, I... I, I Went in Walmart and switched the price tag. Come on. Now all of a sudden Satan says, you're going to hell. Now I have to own up to the what? The wrong I've done. What I did wasn't what? Right. But what Satan cannot do is strip me. Now what I must realize, I can't play that game. I have to realize God. There you go. And see, you don't keep going over and over and over and over and over and over and over. And over. You, you, you got me? So now the Holy Spirit has done what? Convicted us. He has drawn us. Now in his drawing power, he borns us. God, you, 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 if you are born in this family by God, you are rooted. But if you got hooked up for the wrong reason, you're going to get lost. Surely I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Born, 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 born. So the Holy Spirit does what? Convicts us of sin 
and draws us to God, number one. Secondly, the Holy Spirit borns us as into the family of God. Number three, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 and 13. The Holy Spirit baptizes us into the body of Christ. Listen to what Paul says. Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, or I am Cephas, or I am of Christ. Mm. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Now y'all all know where I'm going with this. I said the Holy Spirit baptizes you. Why is it we have such strong relationship issues and personality driven rather than Holy Spirit driven? That means I do the baptizing, but you ain't baptized in Paul's name. Yeah, but you'd be surprised. You got folk that are put off the baptism if the pastor's sick. I, I just don't want so and so bad. What difference does it make? See how we get off into Stuff that don't make no sense. Like you're going to die and go to heaven and get up there and the Lord says, Pastor Paul baptized you, check that off. No. You, you, you caught up in the person. Hello, y'all. I, I, I just don't think it's right for nobody else to baptize unless the pastor's doing it. And that's why some, the black church is going to kill off every black preacher we got. Because let me tell y'all why. Y'all y'all elevators up here. And then y'all want us to do it all. Y'all want us to do it all. And the moment it's, it changes, it's like, that just ain't right. That's why some of y'all never could go to a predominant white church cause that pastor ain't finna do none of them thing he, he ain't gonna even marry you they, they got a past, a preacher who does weddings yeah got a, got a preacher who gonna handle funerals I just don't think that right the pastor didn't preach the funeral that ain't gonna get no negro in heaven I hope I'm making, I mean, I, I'm not trying, I'm trying to teach us. When you are right in your relationship with God, things of that nature does not matter. And th does everybody hear me? Whew. I mean, man, we, we were driving from Muskegon, Michigan snowing like crazy and we got down to Chicago it got worse I think we was probably moving five maybe five miles an hour it was just that bad snow you couldn't open the door it was just everywhere man on my way to a funeral yes on my way I'm sitting there talking to my wife I said in a minute we're going to be at a funeral we're going to be dead you, you know, you have to use, it. We, we pulled off, got a hotel room and called and said, look, y'all ain't going to see us. Y'all are not going to see us. No, no hard feelings, but she already did. It wasn't like I was rushing that, you know, chat with a fortune time. Mother Bone was already gone. <laughs> 
you know, and we, we had to realize that. You, you know, when we show hate, I don't, I don't care what y'all don't hate. I got my family with me. I mean, it was just that bad. And we were blessed to get a hotel room. Boy, we flocked in that room. Have mercy, Jesus. It was like we had made it to heaven. Because if y'all never experienced that, the, the point I'm trying to get us to understand, there comes a point you got to know without a doubt, you've been baptized in, that, in the body of Christ, you die, all is well. That's it. All is well. Take it or what? Leave it. One more, one more, one more, one more, one more, one more. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. He can't be divided. But black folk would divide him as sure as I'm talking to you. I've seen him hold up waiting on somebody. On, on program, we, he down for his grip. Okay, somebody else, move on. Come on now, y'all. I mean, it ain't like the person up there at the gate waiting on the Lord to say, you know who you had on program, didn't even make it there? Bro, <laughs> go on, go. <laughs> All right, num number four, number four, number four. Last one. One more after that, then we're going home. The Holy Spirit, I mean, Romans 8 and 9. Let me go there. Romans 8 and 9, 14 and 16. The Holy Spirit indwells us, leads us, and assures us. And I don't, see, and this is where problems kick in. Folk looking to be led, but they don't have him to lead them. <laughs> now you see, and, and you're wasting your time talking to somebody who does not have a relationship with him. How do I get the Lord to lead me? Invite him in your life. Listen to Paul. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not what? He is. Verse 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the what? Sons of God. So if you ain't being led, you don't belong to him. Boy, boy, boy. Verse 16, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. You ain't got to walk with nobody and ask them, do I have him? His Spirit within you will give you the assurance you belong to him. I know I'm, I'm baptized, born again, washed in the blood. He belongs to me and he got me. Last one. The Holy Spirit seals us until the day of redemption. How can I prove it? Ephesians 4 and 30. Ephesians 4 and 30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of what? Redemption. Y'all can't untie what he stamped on me. Y'all got me? And ain't no date put on me. Date is stamped on what you buy at the grocery store. It say a best buy, such such a date. And if you ain't careful, you'll get confused on that. You say, oh, it said best buy. No, no, that's sell buy. They had to sell it based on a certain date. Didn't mean you couldn't go home and put it in the free. Now, don't leave it back there and, and for a long, long period of time. But in this case right here, I'm sealed. And so are you. If you are properly what? Born again. But look at how Satan plays with our minds. Now, did all of that to connect to what John had just finished talking to us about. Okay. Okay. 